I don't know if people come through this actually um, by Fraser Consultancy, but it's a really interesting study into looking at how people react to brand reputation. And Karen does this every year, it's Karen Fraser. I really recommend you look at it because it looks at what the values of, of people are doing. And also what is interesting, how values are changing, for example. Yeah, honesty and trust is really key. We all know if you work in the world of brand, trust is the number one thing. If they don't trust you, you're screwed, right? And what happens when a brand screws up on trust? Look what Pampers have just done. Whoa, you know, it lost trust with an enormous number of consumers by putting a new, new version of the nappy in the bag and not even telling people. And it's only when they got to the bottom and they discovered a note saying, congratulations, Congratulations, you just tried out a new nappy. Unfortunately, the nappy resulted in lots of babies having burns and nasty red bits and, you know, and leaked. So they destroyed trust an enormous number of consumers. Um, yeah, so trust and honesty is really important. People want to believe. Health is very important. You know, people care about the health of the nation themselves. Supply chain, they, they're interested in how people are treated. You know, a company that abuses people is not going to go down well, no matter how many trees it's planting. Data is a new one. People are actually concerned about the ethics of data. We've got all my data. How are you using it? Are you abusing it? And environmental issues, yes. And ethos, really important. I think it was said earlier, I think by Dave. You've got to start with the ethos. You can done any campaign you like saying, I'm green and caring. But if your ethos isn't behind it, it won't happen. And, you know, it's very, very important that. Ethos is absolutely essential. What consumers key into, that brand managers seem to miss, is ethos. Body Shop was trusted and believed because the ethos was driven by its leader, Anita Roddick, who people believed and trusted. What happened when L'Oreal took it over? Boom, trust went down. What happened when Nestle, who owned L'Oreal, put in chemicals that were tested on animals? You know, well, the response to that was, well, there's no big surprise there, is there? You know, it's Nestle by L'Oreal, you're going to get people thinking, well, we don't trust them. So trust is really important. That's absolutely key. And so you've got to start with the ethos. So the ethos isn't there, you're largely wasting your time. I think the head of E.ON said, why is everyone trying to be green in the utilities market? We're not green. Therefore, why don't we just be honest about it? We deliver electricity. We can try and clean our act up a bit, but let's not pretend to be green. At least that's the most honest comment I've heard from any utility company other than the three green ones who are very green. Uh, and, you know, fine. Do you know what's the shame about this ad? They could have told the truth and it would have been a good ad. Okay? They took an old line, which had been around for ages, don't throw anything away because there's no way, and they made a statement about how their CO2 was helping to grow flowers. Beautiful idea, you know, statement. They just missed out one point. It wasn't a lot of CO2. It wasn't even a bit of CO2. It wasn't even a little bit of CO2. It was a minuscule little bit of CO2. You know, like 0.2% or something. It was just... But they made the impression that they were really doing big things. So they'd been honest and said, we're only using a little bit, but you know what, guys? We're working on it. Then they would have actually scored a lot of points. Right. And so it became one of the most greenwashed ads. Ironically, done by the same people who did the um, bag, by the way. It's not a plastic bag. And also I worked on um, Change the World for a Fiver. So obviously that doesn't pay, but these guys do. Uh, I think the other thing you've got to understand as well now is the consumer is all in power. We talk about social networking, but the birth of brand terrorism, which is, I've done a whole chapter on it in there, the ability for people to actually murder and slaughter a brand by literally using the internet. I mean, the consumer is now realizing it's very empowered. You looked at what beautiful case of when Apple were getting heavily criticized about their sustainability. And what Greenpeace did, they ran a campaign and gave all their people materials to make, you know, spoof ads and, and mock Apple. And it really worked. You know, and so the internet is becoming very powerful. But it's not just the internet, by the way. People still talk to each other in shops, in bars, and clubs. It's just as big a market out there than the normal, the real face-to-face, -face, what people say. So you know, you have to be very careful. You will get screwed if you lie. And that's what happened with Pampers, for example. I mean, they set up a Facebook group. It went around the internet. Thousands of people started saying their babies were now getting, you know, sores. And then someone christened the term chemical burns. I think my child's got a chemical burn. Suddenly, it goes all the way around. Now, all the mothers don't see us rash. They see a chemical burn. And then they start legal proceedings. You know, you can see how dangerous it can be. So now, all of a sudden, Pampers is the company that gave babies chemical burns. Yeah, and there's a lovely comment on one, which is tested on babies, not on animals. You know. Yeah, shit like that sticks, you know. And finally, who do you trust more, Ben and Jerry's or Hagen Dass? Virgin or B&A, M&S or Tesco's, Body Shop or L'Oreal? We trust the brands we believe have good ethoses. And interesting enough, we trust the, the brands 
that have people behind them. People. The reason that M&S did so well in Plan A was because Rose got up and said it. A guy gets up. When did the head of Tesco's ever get up and say anything? You know, other than look, we made lots of money. <laughs> yeah, have another cigar. Um, you know, the point is that we believe the people behind us, and when they get sold off, we then kind of think, you know, what's happened? But he's got the best PR of life, hasn't he? You know, Branson, Mr. Clean and Squeaky. <laughs> yeah, we all know the other stories, but you know, Anita Roddick, fantastic. You know, Stuart Rose, the Ben and Jerry guys. It's all about authenticity, real people. We trust real people. We believe real people. We don't trust brands, and that's the problem. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, we've slightly overrun on time, but if there are one or two questions from the audience, we can take them quickly. Okay. So at that back. Oh, yes. No, no, no. So I can't hear you. I hear you in my head. question really, in fact I just a very quick anecdote just to frame this question. Um, I, I don't come from branding, I come from an operational background. And so we did some work with a client who, where we were trying to remove a really bad waste stream from their, from their uh, recycling. And that was, that was um, organic waste that they were producing because they were a big food producer. But we did, what they did to, to respond to that was to wrap individual produce with plastic, which extended the shelf life by five times. Which was worse, producing four tons of plastic or 40 tons of organic waste. And yet the consumer perception was that when we started wrapping individual items of produce, they went absolutely bananas. So excuse the pun. This, this is the dilemma, actually, because the consumer attitude changes, and it can have lots of the media. If you look at the way the media portrays ethics, we, we did some studies over this, where we actually looked at how the media was, was changing the agenda constantly, which is why, with the ethical sphere, you have to look at all the different aspects. For example, you know, replanting, you know, a plant a tree was considered great. It was all very good and offsetting, and everyone was going on about it. Then all of a sudden, it became bad. You know, this is the dilemma. In the world of ethics, whatever you do, there's someone's going to criticise you. It's all a balancing game. And you'll find some things respond well to the consumer, even though you know that actually it isn't as good, but the consumer buys it. I mean, the whole world of recycling paper is a very interesting one. And you look at the perceptions of recycling versus the realities. Yeah, most people don't have the facts. The consumer is fed by the media, and if the media says, that's better, that's what they do. So uh, the, the dilemma you've always got is to find out what the consumer perception is. The trouble is, you think it's great. I know one courier company is going to swap over to electric vehicles, but then discovered that there were some people starting to mute complaints about electric vehicles. Well, maybe not valid, but they decided that it would be dangerous because they could invest, you know, £100,000 in the number of electric vehicles only in a year's time to be then told that's bad. So they didn't take the risk, which is unfortunately bad for the electric industry. But that's the problem, you see. What's in one minute's out the next. It, you really got to track and do your research. You've got to find out what the consumer perceptions are and find out where to go. But unfortunately, doing the best thing sometimes isn't always seen as doing the best thing. Okay. That's, that's really good luck. Okay. Thanks. Cheers, Chris.